All right, we are recording. Um, welcome to Building Empathy, Building Compassion. We'll figure out what the actual name is over time. Uh, but let me let me pray. Lord, uh, Jesus, in all in all things, we just we just long to honor you. We love you, and we welcome you to come and to be here with us. Lord, would you help us grow in compassion? Lord, help us build empathy. And so would you give us listening ears, Lord? Would you allow us to hear what it is you want us to hear? Would you silence anything that's not of you, Lord, or anything you don't have for us today? Um, and so it, with, with humility, we move forward into this. Um, and I just pray that you would, uh, you would just keep unity among us. Um, we love you. We love you. We love you. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Cool. So, um, so what we're going to do tonight is going to be a little bit different than last week. Last week we watched the full video and then talked about it at the end. Um, what we're going to do this week is we're just going to watch short clips. Um, they're anywhere from two to four or five minute clips that Adam and I kind of selected out of the video. We're going to watch those clips and then we're going to talk about it. We'll watch the next clip and we'll talk. We'll talk about it and we'll we'll kind of do it do it that way. Does that make sense? So. Um, I'm going to do a screen share to watch the video, and then we'll come back and we'll discuss in a group like this um, and see if this works a little bit better than, than it did last week. Um, cool. So this is building empathy, building compassion. This is reconstruction um, to the early civil rights movement. We'll start with a little bit of a summary of what that means. So of history that is really not well known uh, by your typical American, you know, when you've, when you've studied uh, your uh, American history at high school and college level. Most Americans don't know this era. We, look, we, all of us, we tend to focus on the glamorous things and the heroic things, you know, so we know the, we know the revolution and we know the War of 1812, and we know the American Civil War, and we know World War One, and we know World War II, um, and maybe we get into a little bit of Vietnam and the unrest of the 60s, but generally, you know, th th this is a section of, of American history that people don't camp on when they're, when they're teaching. And by the way, it doesn't matter where you study American history. One of the interesting things about the study of Reconstruction in the last 30 or 40 years that has come out is professional historians have noted that the history textbooks in the Northern United States generally gave sort of a Southern take on reconstructionism. That is, they were very, very sympathetic towards the Southern complaints against the reconstruction governments themselves to 1877. And, uh, and, 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 and then not adequately talking about the social ramifications of that uh, in Jim Crow culture. So I, you know, the first thing I want to say is that this is an area of history where we could all as Americans uh, benefit from giving a little more attention. And I, if, if, if I were to turn my camera somehow to show you my shelf uh, here in my home office, you'd see an entire row of books that are on this era of history. Why? Because as a guy that graduated undergraduate in history at Furman that studied uh, historical theology at, uh, at the master's level and the PhD level, I don't know enough about this. And, I, and I'm trying to educate myself now. I'm almost 60 years old about things that really I should have known in my 20s, Jim. So, you know, if, 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 if anybody thinks I'm wagging my finger at them, uh, you know, I'm, I promise you I'm wagging my finger at myself before... Uh, I'm wagging my finger at anybody else. So let me let me come back to Reconstruction and say he, here's the typical way that Reconstructionism is in, is is sort of taught at, at the high school or college level. In Reconstruction, you, you had military and political occupation of the South by 
the union. You had a lot of cronyism and corruption and carpetbaggers and scalawags and unscrupulous things. And finally, you know, 1877 Reconstruction ends. Southerners throw off the oppressive yoke of the of federal interventionism, and things start get, you know, getting back to normal again. And Southerners could rebuild their way of life. And when you when you go into that history now with your eyes open, what you realize is that's a that's a terrible retelling of that history. And what actually happened is a lot of the worst things today, Jim, really, th their roots are there, even, even more than from before the war, okay? Like, I think a lot of the racial animus that exists in the southern United States derives from Reconstruction uh, more than from before the war. Now, part of that is because power dynamics have changed. You know, power, power uh, uh, southern power... Uh, in the dominant class is not threatened before the war. After the war, it's, it's threatened. You know, uh, power sharing is mandated during Reconstruction, and then there's a there's an a, there's an attempt to regrab the power by the dominant class, and that's what's that's definitely what is going on in the era right after uh, Reconstruction. In the meantime, they're working really hard to rewrite the history of the war. You know, so you know you have you have you have Southern leadership saying we're going to retell this thing uh, in in a way that is going to be more compelling uh, and and more favorable uh, to us. And so it, it, again, it doesn't surprise me that Southerners are unaware because there have been people that have been working hard for them to be unaware uh, of these things. And I, you know, my, both my father and my father-in-law were publishers, and um, I, I've got books that they published. All right. So, so real quick. So, Adam. So, so Adam has told me. For those of you who are not here last week, Adam has told me I'm not allowed to call him a novice historian. Um, so I'm calling him our our local history buff. Um, and he doesn't even like that, but I'm calling him that. Um, so Willie, can you? just for for us like not even history buffs in can you just summarize what reconstruction was and then we'll go that that was the um post-civil war laws passed by what would be just the northern states because the southern states obviously didn't have representation in congress or anything else after the immediately after the war they passed laws to ensure the civil rights for freed slaves and blacks in general in the U.S., but particularly the South. And Reconstruction actually involved sending federal troops into the South to ensure that the laws were being followed and basically military government in the South so they could reestablish functioning democratic governments that can actually obey the laws of the U.S. Gotcha. Is it what what kind of do you do you know what kind of time period? I think I heard him say 77 or. Yeah, I mean, that it ends in 1877 out of the compromise result of the 1876 election. OK, you just I know we have that scheduled for a, a couple here from now, a couple from now. But let's just let's just go ahead and jump into that. So so Reconstruction started right after the end of the Civil War. Troops were troops were sent to the South to ensure civil rights, to ensure fair treatment of of blacks. Right, because there were because m m many blacks were still living in among the people that had just like owned them as property, right? Yes. And so and so, tell me how how did Reconstruction end? Why did Reconstruction end? I mean, obviously, it wasn't very popular with the um, the people who'd been in power before the Civil War in the South, and even people who were in power after the Civil War in the South, they weren't obviously happy with having federal troops down there and telling them what to do. Um, so we get to the 1876 presidential election and the Republican candidate is Rutherford B. Hayes, which gives us, you know, the very local connection to that. From where? Delaware, Ohio. Delaware, Ohio. Yeah. So um, it comes down to a contested election, basically, when it's done, they're fighting over, I believe it was Florida, Louisiana and South Carolina, which were the three southern states that still had Republican control in the Reconstruction era. They're fighting over what results are going to be accepted, what not in the Electoral College. 
Um, so basically, he ends up with a one vote lead. It's challenged by the Democrats and they start to do. Hayes's camp speaks with some moderate Democrats kind of behind the scenes when try to I mean, both parties are talking about we'll take the presidency by force. Sounds vaguely familiar. Mm -hmm. um, but they work out a deal with basically the Democrats agree not to contest Hayes becoming president. In turn, he agrees to end reconstruction and pull all federal troops out of the South. So, I mean, once the Democrats hold true on their deal to not contest Hayes, he becomes president and he swiftly ends and pulls the last troops out. And I believe the last occupied states were South Carolina and Louisiana. So it, after that happens, there is literally no no one in the South from the North kind of ensuring the freedom, the civil rights, the fair treatment of recently freed slaves. Effectively, no. Okay. Okay. And so that kind of 77, 76, 77 marked the end of Reconstruction and then moving forward. That, that's yep. Fair. Okay. Cool. So that's a good summary just to kind of, this is, this is where we're kicking off with the beginning of this. Um, and so let's jump back into the video and then we'll have more conversation um, along the way here. And, and then we get done with these videos. If anyone's got questions, comments, jump in with them. Yep. That, that published this thrown up against them by the dominant population. By the way, one thing we haven't said yet, I just want to mention it before we just pass on is this. Uh, white kind of stuff about white fragility and, and all this kind of stuff. And I, one thing that I want to say they are we can't really hear him it's we're hearing a child over that adam i think that's you um because the idea of whiteness is clearly a 19th century idea and by the way it's shorthand really for white anglo-saxon protestant from northern europe okay because there's just as much prejudice against those kinds of people with with those kinds of people towards um, towards, you know, East Europeans or Italians uh, or even Irish and, and Polish and other lower class immigrants uh, as, as there are against other races. And so the, the, this whole idea of whiteness and defining whiteness is a 19th century idea. And so I think it's really important not to read that, that back into the annals of all history uh that's that in and of itself was a social power construct all right, i'm moving i'm gonna uh, move forward just a little to, bit here explain what black codes are and how they affected the reconstruction well you know after the war you you, you already um you, you and, and and especially after reconstruction after after all the federal constraints are gone uh you immediately start people uh, start seeing people in state governments uh, write codes and even new constitutions, Justin, that are designed to disenfranchise black people politically and economically. So for instance, in Mississippi in 1894, we write a new constitution. And uh, inter interestingly, by the way, we adopt a, a, a new flag in 1894. And uh, that new flag has the Confederate battle flag, the, the, the battle flag of the Army of Northern uh, Virginia emblazoned in the upper left corner Canton. Uh, and and that it, it's meant to send a message. It's Yes, it's meant to send a message to Washington, D.C., but it's especially meant to send a message to a majority of the people that occupy the state of Mississippi who happen to be black. Uh, and the message is, this is not your state. This is our state. And we're in charge here, and you're not. And the Constitution of 1894 puts into place a range of um, electoral uh, uh, advantages to white people in Mississippi because, again, white people, they're threatened because they're the they're the numerical minority, and they don't want they don't want blacks to coalesce and have political power. There are restrictions on black involvement in political parties. Um, there are um, it's, things start coming into place like um, poll taxes and literacy tests and all manner of things in these sorts of black codes that are meant to limit 
and diminish black political power and equal access to the law. And I mean, it happened, by the way, Mississippi's Constitution of 1894 becomes a template for how everybody else in the South is going to try and do this. And um, that's really the beginning of Jim Crow. You know, that it's it's that it, that that's that's what we now call Jim Crow. And it's it's all designed to um, to restrict black political power and and economic power and to continue to enfranchise that power in the, the dominant group in society. And, and am I correct to understand that it was primarily uh, infringing on political power, but also included all the way down to just real life, signing contracts, marrying, settling, where to settle? Is it, is it, was it just political or does it comprehend? Oh, I, absolutely. That's right. It, you know, it, it, it hits economic, it, it you know, it, uh, it, it hits at society, you know, it, you know who, who can sign as a witness on a contract, um, who can, you know, what property rights, you know, all, all manner of things are touched upon in that area. And oh, let me say, here's the other thing. Now, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure when this dawned on me. There, there's a little clip that you can get, I mean, just Google it. Of, of Martin Luther King talking about why African Americans are in a different position than other immigrants to the United States um, and even the Native Americans, uh, and he you know, he explains that look you know the other immigrants were being offered forty acres and a mule uh, you know even as awful as the Trail of Tears is they're they're still there's a U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs, and there are at least some negotiations that are going along there, uh, providing not reparations, but at least certain provisions for the Native Americans. But for 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 Black Americans, they were released from slavery with nothing. You know, I I, I, I was reared on these um, these stories. And I, I don't want to make I don't want to make complete fun of them, but I, for instance, here's here's a family story that was told um, that my you know great grandfather McDowell in Liberty Hill, South Carolina, after the war, would plow in his frock tail coat, you know, because he no longer has slaves, and he had lived he had, he had lived a patrician life, and the only clothes that he had were you know what we would call today white tie and tails, and and he would be out plowing in his frock tail. Coat. And then it would be told, and all his slaves loved him so much that they stayed with him uh, after the war. Well, you know, that that kind of story can be told by white Southerners to buttress various myths. Ah, see, uh, black slaves must not have been treated that badly. Why in the world would they stay around after the war? Here's the question. Where would they go? And what would they do? And how would they feel that they, they've got nothing? Okay, they're free, but they've got zilch, nada. They have no property. They have no money. They have no social enfranchisement. Where exactly are they going to go? And so really, the the survival of, of, uh, of American black folk descended from slaves in that, I mean, it's one of the great stories in the history of the world of people literally starting with nothing and being able to get where they are today. It cool. Um, <clears throat> so, so just to kind of remind everybody here. So the, the goal, the goal of this time isn't just a history lesson, right? But, you know, we talked about the first week of one of the first steps to building compassion, um, building empathy, is, is beginning to see through someone else's eyes. And as you, as be, you begin to see, their, see and understand their perspective, it can help compassion grow inside of us. And so, Adam, I'm gonna ask this question to you first, and then I'm ask it, gonna ask it. Um, what's, what's one thing that you hear there, brother, that that helps grow, grow inside of I mean, I think particularly in that, like there's a, a whole bunch of stuff that 
whole people group had to deal with that others haven't had to experience. And that obviously cleats, I mean, you know, they talk about, you know, America has a, a founding myth, so to speak, like the, this, the story of how the country's founded, everyone thinks of that, whether it's true or not, not all the aspects doesn't matter, but that's the experience that everyone looks at and thinks about how the country was formed. We have an entire group of people who have a, uh, a history, a founding history that's completely almost alien to so much of the rest of the population. Whatever group that is, whatever hardships they've experienced, this is completely different than that. And that needs to be looked at. And that's passed down just like the the, the history of how this country is founded is passed down. Well, that's passed down as well. Everyone thinks about how did their grandparents get here? Well, this is a similar thing. Yeah. I think for me, one of the things that stuck out the most was like, I can imagine, like, could you imagine what like, like after the war, when the troops were still there and whatnot, there, there had to be like this beautiful glimmer of hope for what, 10, 12 years that, that things could be significantly different. And then, you know, 1970 or 1877, like the moment that happened, I, I can only imagine once like them watching the troops, like pulling out of town. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, you're seeing African-Americans elected to the U.S. Congress and to the state legislators in those states in the Reconstruction era. But that's all wiped away post-1877. Right, right. And so, and so open up the same thing for you guys. What did, what did you hear in that, um, in that six minutes that, that kind of helped you build compassion? What helped you see, see through their eyes? I think for me, it's when they were talking about that they started out with nothing. Like, I've just, I've never been in a place like that in my life where it's like, I have nothing, you know? So just just framing my mind around that, that how does that feel? How does it feel that to have nothing? Or how does it feel to, you know, have to earn everything you've had? which, you know, a lot of Americans, because of their parents, because of their family, they don't have to start out with nothing. But these people did. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Michael. What else? <clears throat> when I list, I actually listened to this earlier today, and one of the things that struck me was just how lied to I feel because, well, I'll just be honest, I love history now in a way that I didn't when I was growing up and, and homeschooling changed all that things for me. Um, and I began to be, you know, far more interested in, you know, anything to do with, with history, but still I have memory of reading the assignments. I have memory of being taught, you know, in school and, <clears throat> I don't know. Some homeschoolers are really cynical and think that everything is like it, all textbooks are bad and that, you know, history was rewritten. But I don't think this is what they were talking about. You know, they're, it, it's just when, when I was listening to him talk about um, you stopped at this time when he said that both his father and his father in law were publishers. But he goes on to just say that they published textbooks that were revisionist history or when I think about it, it just, sorry for the clock. It sounds like everyone who um, was in any kind of power position in any way, even the educators and the writers of history, um, they were white, you know, they, they, everything had to reflect well on, on the whites. And I, you know, I just, I had no idea really of that. I just makes me, I mean, I question 
the newspapers now and I question social media now or, we, you know, because everything is commentary. It's not really journalism. It's not really this is what he said and this is what they said. And it's it's commentary. And, and so it, to me, this is really pertinent right now because I don't know what's truth mm -hmm. half the time that I'm reading. And now I'm really, you know, doubting all of our history books and just it, at least in the way this was portrayed. So the other thing is just thinking about at some point, I don't know if it was in the last one or it was in this one, but at some point, um, you know, he uh, he mentions that they're Calvinists and they believe that everybody is depraved. And so he's like, why should we be surprised, <laughs> you know? And he's right, you know, all the inclinations of man's heart are evil, but this idea of lording over an entire group of people, uh, it's just, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just really hard to, it's hard to, um, it's hard to hear. It's really hard to hear. I think the word that came to my mind, like I heard you say lied to you. I think, I think the word that, that comes to my mind is I think like what, I think what I, what I learned was just incomplete. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't, maybe I was lied to, but I think, but I think there's, there's a significant portion of history that, that was just incomplete mm -hmm. in my, in my, in my schooling, if that makes sense. But yeah. Anybody else before we jump into the next video? I was just going to add to that. I mean, he doesn't talk about it here, but this period that he just, you know, that we're talking about today and in this area, this is also these post reconstruction up until the 1950s is when you see the rise of all the Confederate memorials being built in the South, not all of them, but the vast majority. I mean, so we talk about Mississippi's changing the state flag and putting, you know, the, what we think of as the Confederate flag on it. This is the same time those other things are going, which is really like, even if you're not being, you know, have to deal with the black, have to deal with that, you go downtown and you're seeing the statue. So, I mean, the connotations are completely different for everyone in that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Do they, uh, Adam, do you remember, do they, I have, I have a few questions about uh, black codes and stuff like that. Do they talk about that when we talk about convict leasing? He just mentioned him here, but I think he does make some yeah. reference to him again when we talk about the convict leasing, just saying how easy it was for them to be arrested to get caught up in that. If they if they don't, like, I don't want to skip over that. If, if they don't talk about that in the convict leasing, I'd love to circle back and talk about that a little bit. Okay. Let's, let's jump into that, into that portion of it. Think of sharecropping. What is sharecropping and how is it abused? Well, uh, uh, again, if, if, uh, if, if you are farming on land that belongs to someone else um, and, uh, and, and, and you have limited investment in that, you can have just, just like payday lenders can take 40% of your check. The, the guy that you're farming the land from can take an inordinate amount of your yield uh, all in the name of, Hey, you don't own the land. I own the land. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a businessman and, you know, and I'm, I'm generously working with you on my land and the cut of what you create, you know, disproportionately goes to someone else. It, by the way, interestingly, Justin, what an, an EPC minister, in uh, in Louisiana has been, and I won't embarrass him by saying his name, but he's been one of the real generous supporters of the African American Leadership Scholarship at um, at RTS. And he he came to me. It was more than a decade ago, and he said, "I realized that my family uh, they had massive plantations in Louisiana before the war. They had massive sharecropping." farms after the war. And I realized that my family had disproportionately benefited from the labor of these African Americans, most of whom were Christians, Bible believing Christians like me. And I, one thing I want to do, 
uh, is I want to give to this scholarship fund out of my out of my family money because I know that some of my family money exists today because of the labor of these um, of these folks. And so that kind of thing, uh, that economic disadvantage, again, you can think when you, you, you just like a person with bad credit or no credit is in trouble when you go to, you know, to buy a car or get a loan uh, to do something. Well, think of that and worse in a system like sharecropping. You know, you're over a barrel in that kind of a setting. All right, so sharecropping is one aspect of slavery by another name. You have peonage or debt slavery. You have vagrancy laws. Uh, and really, these things begin to work together to put African Americans in a position where they can't get a job. And then they are, you know, they're actually laws that put them in jail because they can't get a job that society doesn't allow them to have. And it seems like it becomes this, this self-perpetuating thing. Uh, so yeah, I'd just love for you to speak to that. I know in, in Mississippi, at, at one point, if I, my statistics are right, 70% of the state's income was from African Americans in prison doing work, doing labor for them. So, so flesh all that out. Yeah, I, th that would have been a part of history that I would have been completely oblivious to until, I don't know, 20 years ago, Jim. And I, one thing that I've kicked myself about is I took Old South, New South at Furman University under an excellent historian, Albert Sanders. I mean, just did a terrific, I mean, we, we read all of the classic stuff, Van Woodward, all of, you know, all of the, all of the stuff. And, and somehow this did not register to me. I, I've even, I've even gone back, David Calhoun at Covenant Seminary taught, um, that there was a, there was a THM level course called Southern Presbyterianism. And I, I pull my notes out about, um, I don't know, five, seven years ago to that class. And he had sprinkled all the breadcrumbs out for me. Uh, and I would have taken that somewhere in 1986, 19, yeah, 1985, 1986, maybe early 1987. And it just didn't click. You know, I, I might as well have been studying ancient Italy or something like that. It just didn't, it didn't click. And so I don't think a lot of people know that, um, you know, uh, uh, Today, when people uh, when people hear uh, folks talking about criminal justice reform and prison reform, uh, that there are things that we are dealing with today that are rooted in, you know, you, you arrest a guy for vagrancy, you put him in prison, you give him this ridiculous sentence, uh, and then you lease him out to do contract work for the local plantation. Well, he's a free man. <laughs> Now there's no slavery anymore, but he's doing contract labor, and the state's making money uh, off of it. Um, and 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 this is happening all over the place um, in in the southern United States. So what you have is a legal system, an economic system, and a social system that is designed to thwart the purposes of the Emancipation Proclamation and the Bill of Rights and all the other things that are ours as Americans for a particular class of Americans. All right, so I remember when I, I, honestly, I really didn't learn this until just maybe a few years ago, probably when I, when I watched uh, 13th for the first time. Um, and it was, I remember it being so interested that like they, the, it was it was often these convicts were were leased out to plantation owners that used to have like hundreds of slaves so it's almost like they placed them right back into the same position they were um but adam do you, what do you what do you, what do you what do you want to add to that as it comes to black codes as it comes to convict leasing um what other information do you think would be helpful for us? And then I'll open it up to anybody else. Um, I think particularly on the black codes, just, I know he like touches on it, but just to really say like, they basically made it like loitering, curfew, vagrancy, not having a job, having a weapon, not even carrying proof of employment. So some of those things, while they may have not said, you know, specifically, it only applies to Africa, to black people, they could have, a lot of times they would just only enforce it on those as well. So you see basically like, unless you are 
doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing as they saw it, then there was, they could almost always find some reason to do that. And I mean, depending on where you look at, you're talking thousands, but I mean, I mean, look at one of them, um, this is the National Endowment for Humanities one, so they estimated like 800,000, but they could have been, had to deal with that, those penalties of the justice system being put on them during that time and then forced into involuntary servitude. And I mean, that really continues up through the thirties. And I mean, it's federal government's not until really like five days after Pearl Harbor is when they actually officially make it illegal to do. I mean, it falls out in the thirties, but you're seeing it all the way up through there. Yeah. It's really interesting. Like why, why would it be five days after Pearl Harbor? Is it, I mean, uh, this is just assumption that maybe they needed people to fight. Right. No, no. I think from what I read on that, it just seems the federal rulemaking process was already the wheels were turning on that pre that. So. Um, so, so what I heard you say is kind of very simple laws that like don't exist now. Right. So mm -hmm. loitering in front of a grocery store. Um, what, what is vagrancy? Mean? Do you know? Like, I, I, without looking at the laws, I don't know, but basically you can't be the, generally speaking, I'm assuming this, you can't be the homeless person. Okay. So, I mean, so, so very minor curfew laws, uh, that people could actually, men could actually be arrested, men and women could actually be arrested. And then instead of sitting in a jail, they were actually leased by the state to plantation owners. Plantation owners would pay some kind of a fee to the state. And then these men and women would be forced into involuntary servitude for astronomical prison sentences based off of the crime mm -hmm. that committed. Is that that accurate? Yeah, I'm not sure of the links of those, but obviously, I mean, you're talking people being sentenced to prison for simple things that, you know, really, even if you're going to make them illegal, I mean, loitering would be kind of like trespassing today. That's going to probably, you know, get you a fine at best, generally speaking. Right. So, I mean, we're talking people being sent to prison and then leased out to someone who has no economic interest in whether or not they're treated nicely, right. let mm -hmm. alone humanely. Right. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have something? Um, this is JC. I know you can't see me, but I just had a, I had a thought about just coming from like an empathy perspective of like, imagine, imagine the, the, you know, the trauma that you went through, like being a part of, of a family in slavery and then being quote unquote set free yeah. and then having someone be able to like reintroduce you to slavery through unjust means of arrests that yeah. aren't actually legitimate and then you get thrown back into this trauma environment where you're a convict and, and back into slavery and just the threat of entering constantly the threat of having to enter back into a traumatic environment of slavery and then just also the awareness that I just kind of have like an epiphany as I was sitting here like wow the mistrust for African Americans around the justice system, around police relationships have stemmed back generationally for so long and for rightful reasons because of these things that did go on between them and, and police at the time who, you know, did have maybe intentions to arrest for not legitimate reasons to, for this very reason. So it's just, I didn't really, I think there's generational trauma that is, um, you could even be subconscious at some of this of just learned, like, I can't imagine, like, even the stories and families that have been passed down around that subject. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you, you kind of heard Ligon mention it kind of, about kind of veiled just about like, some of the impacts of things that are happening today like started back then, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to even know where to start now. Um, yeah, and I don't think, they, I don't, he doesn't really touch on it in here, but I mean, you'll see all this stuff going on. I mean, I, 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 I had two things, I guess, kind of put them in a better order. One is you've got people who like, like you said, JC, they had like this hope for a brief period of time. And these people, so many people who had never had the, the freedom really to speak out to do this. I mean, they finally have hope. They see people who look like them. They see them having theoretically civil rights and people who look like them being elected to the U.S. Congress. 
only to within, you know, just 20, basically 20 years, see that door slam shut. And now they're all back to that same way they were before and perhaps worse off because anyone who rose up during that time is now facing even more repercussions for daring to go against what the system and the power was. And I mean, and, and then what you don't think it really touched on here is because all this is going on so much in the South, you see, begin to see the, the great migration begin as we get into like, you know, 1890s, 1910, 1920s. I mean, you see so many black people in the South just decide I've got to get out of here. We've got to get out of here. If I want my family to be able to live, if I want my kids to be able to do anything, you see that begin push to be North. I mean, it's not perfect by any means in the North, but you're not seeing the same things to that degree that you are down there. And that's, there's a beacon that way. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Beth wrote, um, talking about some present day realities, right? Like felons being barred from voting forever, for after even after serving time or job opportunities, you know, having to check the box, I'm a felon when, apply, when applying for jobs. Those are some of the things that kind of still exist today. Um, I put on here, there's a, there's a couple of documentaries. If, you, if this has sparked an interest to want to know more for you guys here, but also for you guys listening, um, there's two documentaries that I would encourage you to watch. One of them, Slavery by Another Name. And then the documentary 13th, Slavery by Another Name really just focuses on this. 13th is a little broader, but, 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 mentions, but has, has some time spent on, on this specifically. Um, and again, I just want to say, like, I'm not saying everything that are in these documentaries is factually true and I agree with, but they're very informative, um, especially to help look through the eyes of other people that we might not um, fully understand. Um, so anything else on that topic before, before we jump into our next, next focus here? No? Cool. Have your government against you. Well, when you bring up the idea of terror and the use of terror, um, it leads right into this question a horrific legacy of this period were lynchings and sexual mutilations that were executed outside of the the justice system uh, and were still allowed to happen in the west and in the south and in which then the purpose is to terrorize and to create fear and to get in people's heads but why would you say it's important for future generations to know about this topic and i'm thinking through the thousands of lynchings um the tulsa massacre the the red summer rosewood massacre I means that all of the all of these lynchings why is that important to point to tell the truth about and to tell current and future generations well, I mean, for one thing, I, I, I do remember studying some of these things in history in high school and college and elsewhere, but they were all, there were usually code words that were used, like race riots would be used. And that's often a code word for a race massacre. And so there, there are all sorts of ways that these things have been papered over in the history that we have studied in, in our schools that keep it from coming home. Now, I've often thought, you know, if you had, if you had lynched four and a half thousand white people, you know, between the 1870s and, and the 1960s, I mean, we'd have, we'd have destroyed the world over that. I mean, we'd have been dropping bombs. Everywhere. We would have, you know, we would have just gone ballistic on on that. And and yet, that's that's a story of a of a large population of our fellow Americans. And look, as 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 a Southerner, you know, I, 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 uh, Southerners, we live in history. You know, I, and and look, as a, a Southerner of Scottish descent. You know, I, I was taught that Midsummer's Day, thirteen fourteen, is the year that Robert the Bruce defeated the. So, so I, I wish they would actually spend more time, um, talking talking about this, but but I want to spend a little bit of time talk about this idea of of lynching, and then a few you know, um, discuss that a little bit. So, so Adam, there's they. 
we hear this kind of this idea of lynching. Um, what is lynching? Um, as much as you're as much as you're able to to share. I, I don't know if it's an, I, I guess the simplest way to put it is simply an extra an extrajudicial killing, meaning like it's not authorized by the government of someone for either a, a, a violation or a perceived violation. I mean, it could be as simple as there's cases where someone was convicted of a crime and then they're pulling them out and they're killing them outside, you know, for it or all the way up to they're never even charged. Then they're just killed for it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that I looked up something and said, you know, it was it's estimated between 1870 and 1950, there was over like 4,400 plus. I mean, it's kind of really hard to get a documentation on all of that, but I mean, of what they've been able to document. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and it's it's my understanding that a, a lot of, so some sometimes these were fatal, um, other times they were kind of just torturous, um, often including like genital mutil mutilation. And so, you know, I've, I've heard stories of, you know, I think Emmett, was it Emmett Tills? Is that it? Was that his name? Yeah. Who was accused of like hitting on a white woman or, or no, it was, he was accused of rape or anyway, I don't want to speak. I don't know the facts, obviously. Just flirting. He was, he was basically accused in 1955 of just simply flirting with a white woman. Okay. And then he was, he's 14 years old. Yeah. He's 14 years old. And then tell the story. Well, I mean, I, I go ahead. I just was that. I mean, yeah. But was he was he killed? Was he just mutilated? Was he? He he was murdered, murdered. and I mean that his case particularly was kind of a, a really good shock to the conscious because okay. his mother chose to have him. He, he's mutilated after he's killed. And everything else had his funeral in an open casket, mm -hmm. and you're seeing pictures of that appear in Jet magazine. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Um. But so, so one of the, um, one of the things we want to do after this is all over is just to begin to hear some, some like real life experiences. So there's, there's actually a lady in this town that I, that I know and dearly love that, that this actually happened to her, one of her family members in the South. And that's why they live in Marion, Ohio now, because after this happened to one of their family members, they fled North. And she, and this was like during her lifetime. And so um, I hope to have, I hope um, to have her on to just kind of tell the story to help us really connect with um, the fact that this, this really wasn't that long ago. Um, and then Adam, so he, he briefly mentioned this, uh, this Tulsa massacre. You, you, ha you have a book on your shelf about this. So I assume you're probably one of the ones that, that know the most about this. So can you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never heard. We're talking um, 1921, Tulsa, Oklahoma. I had never heard of it until I went to college. I mean, I read a book about it in class. And I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, that, that book's not some secret. It's published in 1982 by, you know, I had to look it up here. But, you know, state of Louisiana, Louisiana State University Press. So, I mean, this isn't like something that no one knew about, but or just rediscovered, but I mean, I, I, I'm curious how many people on here had even heard of that. Yeah, I think, I, th I think for me, until I watched the 13th, I had never heard of it. I mean, in, in this case, I mean, it's just simply someone may have accident, a black man may have accidentally bumped into a white woman in an elevator in Tulsa. Tulsa has a very thriving um, African-American community. In fact, like early on, I mean, early 1900s, a gentleman goes there, buys up a large section of just vacant ground outside Tulsa and just basically builds a black community. I mean, there's people who own airplanes in, in 1921 in Tulsa. It's the Greenwood District. It's got its own banks. It's got its, it's, it's got its own churches. It's got everything there. And then you see this for this perceived offense. They end up basically burning it down riots through the streets killing and i mean right now out in tulsa they're doing some work to figure out there's a the lore is that there was mass graves done by the city to bury some of the um victims of that and just in a mass unmarked grave and they're doing some um work 
to try to find ground penetrating radar where those might be so they can give them the dignity they deserved in death that they didn't get in life. Um, I'll throw the name of the book in there. I mean, I'm sure there's others on it, but this is the one I had, or if anyone ever wanted to look at it, I'd share my copy of it without a problem. Cool. You said you're going to do that in the notes? Yep, I'll put it in there now. Would, now, so that, is this is this similar to what they called Black Wall Street? Um, was that was that the Tulsa the connection with the Tulsa thing? I'm not for sure on that, but it, it very. I mean, you can see various. Um, it, it was a very thriving black community that had been built by blacks. It was so. I mean, it very well could be. I mean, I, I I'm just not 100 percent on that. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, but th this is one of those things. Just like. I don't know that I was led to, but I think that's something really significant in our country that that could be learned um, in, in in history class, right? Um, cool. Is that anything else for that topic? Um, I wanted to add about the Red Summer. He just in a passing mention of the Red Summer, and that kind of aligns with something Beth had put in the notes about military service being a way out, but. You look at the Red Summer, this is 1919, you have all of these African-American troops coming back from fighting in World War I, where, yeah, there were segregated units, but they have been given a lot of dignity doing that. They'd been armed, taught how to fight, and they come back here and they don't fall back into the their station in life that they're supposed to be in the South. And so obviously this is a lot of conflict, but I mean, you look at the Harlem Hellfires, which is a very prestigious segregated unit who did an amazing job in World War I. And then all of a sudden they're supposed to come back here after defending the world, essentially, and then be second class citizens in their home. And obviously that didn't sit well. That didn't sit well with them, understandably. And then there's a whole bunch of people who didn't like people getting uppity and then proceeds to riots. Again, you're seeing this back and forth murders happen because people were willing to stand up for themselves. A lot of white people didn't like the fact that there were black people who were willing to stand up for themselves. Cool, thanks for that. Anybody else have anything they wanna add before we move on to our next? Okay. All right. And again, I just want to kind of continually say this: this, this is this is some sort of a, a history lesson. But the desire here is is to help us see through the eyes of our brothers and sisters of color and their and their and their and their family stories, right? Um, and so and so, watch this. Um, and, and build compassion and build empathy and begin to begin to understand some of the some of the family generational pain um, as as you're watching. And I think to JC's point earlier, I mean, if you look at this, the the Red Summer, the the Tulsa incident, you're seeing where there had been hope. So here they are able to build a thriving community in Tulsa. Here they are able to go fight for this country only to have that dignity ripped away from them again. So I think that is a reoccurring theme of here's hope, but it's just snatched back. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Um, so how was that done and how did the cloistering of black people into ghettos affect generations of accumulated to know that and care about that? Well, one thing I'd like to ask you to drill down on a little bit, you, we've already kind of touched it in the periphery. We know that many tactics were employed uh, to keep people of color, not just without power, but in one area of town. Um, so how was that done and how did the cloistering of black people into ghettos affect generations of accumulated wealth for blacks versus whites? Well, I mean, you know, there are different names that have been given to that. One name that comes into play in the 20th century is redlining. And there would be literally places in town where black people would not be sold to. Uh, and so there were only certain parts of the town that they could go to. And, uh, and, 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 and that clustering also led to the creation of what become the, the ghettos in, in 
And, and by the way, that's a thing not just in the southern United States. That's the thing in the northern United States. The One of the books that I was trying to reach down and grab um, is called Sweet Land of Liberty. And it's called it's basically the forgotten history of the story of the northern civil rights struggle. And so these these realities are not just southern realities. There's, again, just like we were saying in the last show, um, that, that they're continually realities in, in, in every part of the United States, north, south, east, and, and west. And so, you know, they're not only the black people lack the capital that, that most of the dominant culture has it at its disposal, but they're, they're trapped in not being able to buy in the best parts of the city where they're going to hold, instead of their investment depreciating, it's going to appreciate. And, um, and, and, and so, you know, those sorts of things have a generational effect. Um, and, and, and I, property, you know, especially, you know, there, there, there are few things that are more important in terms of building wealth uh, in, in, as in terms of property and being able to hand it on. And when you don't have access to decent areas, um, and, and you're, you're kept in the worst parts, it puts you at a, at a disadvantage that can't be overcome in any other way. So it's funny you say that when we bought our very first house in Starville, Mississippi, walking distance from downtown, um, we had this deed that was given to us that said uh, in the kind of the neighborhood covenants, and I could only have one cow. <laughs> I could I, I had a tractor, I had to park it over here, and the house could never be sold to a black person. And I remember us thinking, I can't sign this, and the realtors were like, "Oh, there's nothing to sign." But but my neighborhood, and I think that's that's deed based restrictions. I don't, I think that's the term. Yeah, and but, look, that that continued even after all of the laws that were passed um, in the 1990s to to try and redress those kinds of situations. Jim, I, I, for instance, I remember as my wife and I were looking for our first home, we had a realtor that knew. Northeast Jackson very well. And we would look at a particular area and she was not allowed to say um, that's a mixed race neighborhood because of the new regulations that have been passed trying to deal with these. But realtors had code words. So she said, no, you don't want to look there. That neighborhood has lost its luster. And so she had not violated the law that had been passed that told them that they couldn't do things like that. But she had sent us a cue. You don't want to. You don't wanna look there because that's a mixed race neighborhood, or black people live uh, in in that neighborhood. So you know those are those are those are just continuing realities that are artifacts of things that were actually written into law and to code in earlier times we're, we're turning uh turning the corner to the finish line so i have one last question and then man there's so 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 much there that we just don't have time to even discuss but let's let's talk about this idea of redlining adam um what is redlining you you discuss you tell people what redlining is i'm going to start i'm going to i'm going to go find that map that we found that you found okay yeah it's about during the new deal era 1934 1933 depending 35 depending on what source you want to look at for that um federal government's trying to there's a shortage of housing stock the federal government's trying to get more houses built and back loans in it as part of this there's a federal agency that's basically tasked with creating maps to say what's good where's good areas in towns to back the loans for those so like today you know most people's house home loans are backed by the federal government um same thing then because you know unless you had a lot of money banks and weren't willing to back those loans so then they literally come out and it's called redlining because they took areas of town that were predominantly african-american and made those areas red and said those are you know um distressed areas basically high risk areas you we, we really shouldn't back loans there you see yellows blues greens and you know you can look at where you, you pulling up columbus's yeah so i mean yeah you'll you'll see um you know upper arlington here 
predominantly, you know, more affluent white community, even in 1930s is still green, good area. Then you'll see like King Lincoln District and some of these areas then that are red. And so now you can't even get a loan in there. So if you have a house in there, you can't buy it because no one's going to back the loan. If you own a house there, you can't, it's, it's becoming hard to sell it to somebody who is also going to need a loan. Now, obviously, if someone wants to come in and, you know, pay you below market value for it, it's going to be, that might be the choice you have is, you know, I hold on to this home or I sell it for less because I'm stuck. I mean, then that continues, starts in the thirties and that's not technically made illegal until the civil rights act of 1968. So, so let's, so this, this took a little bit for me to understand. So let's, let's pull up this map real quick. So, so here's Columbus, Ohio. So and we can throw the, we can throw the, um, the link to this in the um, chat here, but the university of Richmond has done a great job of digitalizing these maps. What year is this? Do you remember new deal 33, 34? Yeah. I think this one's got a date. If you can pull in close enough down in the right, but I mean, this is when this whole process originates is in the new deal roosevelt administration 1934 era 1936 red lining um so so walk us through here what it is you see it and if you look at these didn't happen it's important to point out that these didn't happen in every city because some cities simply didn't have enough housing stock to make a difference on it so i think this website it's got like 13 of them in ohio yeah. um but yeah, I mean, you can look up at the top of that. You'll see today it's still a fluent area. A lot of that, that green in that. Where down here, then you'll see this red. These will be predominantly minority African-American communities. Um, and you'll also see that you fast forward a little bit. These are the same areas. So now they're, they end up being depressed economically because you can't sell houses. People can't buy houses hardly in here. And this is what highways will be cut through later because then they're, they condemn those. The houses are cheaper to condemn. It's easier. There's less resistance to it. So you'll see further degrading of some of those areas by highway system going through there. So just for clarity, this is this is a a map put out by our government about that that helped provide guidance for who they would guarantee mortgage loans on. If you're in a red, if you're in a if you're in a red area. There's very little, if no chance, that you would get a bank loan because it wouldn't be guaranteed by our government. If you're in a green area, you're almost guaranteed to get a loan if you qualify because it's, it would be guaranteed by the government. And this was predominantly a, a racial dynamic. Um, so... What are what are what are thoughts questions Adam do you have anything else you want to add to that that you thought would be think would be helpful for this conversation no and I think it's and again I don't know enough about this and I it, it's hard to completely make sense in my mind of what was there was the end goal segregation with this was the did they really believe despite that there was nothing to back it up that having African Americans in a neighborhood decreased the value of it? But regardless of what the intent was, we can look at what the result was. Yeah. So I think there's, I'm not comfortable arguing over what the, the initial at least was, but we can all say without a doubt what the fallout for this is and why this decreased economic value for people who are already living in this area, it decreased their economic opportunities to do things. And that obviously is gonna cause problems going forward. Yeah, we'll expand on that. What do you mean problems going forward? I mean, if you can't, I mean, if, I think if any of us, if you, if you buy a house for, you know, $25,000 and next thing you know, you can't sell it for anywhere near that. You can only sell it for 15000 and not because you haven't taken care of it, but because no one can get a loan for it. Well, now you're either stuck and staying in this house or taking less for it. So if the opportunity you need to move because of a job opportunity or you've outgrown the house with your family, you're probably going to take a loss on this house or be stuck with it. And, and then you just see that there's no, if you want to build new houses there, you're not going to be able to do that. So it's just, you don't build the wealth to carry, you lose what wealth you have. It makes it hard for everyone. 
to, and then that just sl- starts a slow downward slope because does it really make, even just an economic, does it make sense to pour a lot of money to keep up your house if it's not worth what you paid for it and you can't get that out of it? What are other, what are other thoughts or questions? For, for me, this, like just hearing this stirred me to really want to learn and research more. And so I'm currently reading the book called Color of Law that actually gets into some real specific documented, you know, they, they reference real documents from the government, real situations that can be tracked. And, and so I'm reading, it's called Color of Law right now, just because I, I'm just really curious about this. What other questions or thoughts do you guys have? Say the name of it again. Color of Law. Color of Law. And, and again, like I don't believe everything I read, but um, a lot of times those books help point you to real good hard research. Hey, Jr. Yeah, Tom. And, uh, um, I was just gonna throw in a comment when when those guys uh, were talking about getting those some of these. They were they mentioned the 1990s. And that came back to me because um, in the early 1990s, the guy who was the city attorney of um, Upper Arlington, which we've mentioned here tonight, uh, he had he had um, he had got the position of the city attorney, and I was talking to him about uh, just talking to him about his job one day, and he even he mentioned he said, you know, um, Tom. Here in Upper Arlington, we are still struggling to get the laws off the books that forbid people from selling their homes to Jews. Wow. Okay. So um, anyway, that he um, he was a brother from uh, from Vineyard Columbus, mm. but um, you know it's. Um, Yeah, people do. Um, uh, irrational things right. when they perceive their money is threatened. Yeah, for sure. That uh, I was talking with a uh, a brother of mine who's a who's a realtor in Delaware, and um, he was he he helped sell a house in Lewis Center, Lori, actually down where down real close to where you guys used to live. Um over off of the old state there. And he said that as, as he was selling this house, they got a copy of the deed. And, and on this deed, it said to not be sold to, to colored. In Lewis, Lewis Center, Ohio in the North and the, and that was in, uh, in 2019, I believe, 2019 or 2018, but it was still on that deed. I know we had talked about throwing it in next week, but since we kind of went there, I mean, I know, Chapel Heights Cemetery, north of town here in Marion. Um, My uncle died as an infant in the 50s and my grandmother um, bought plots there for him. And when we were looking at the deeds they still had for those additional plots they bought, this was, I mean, the deeds would have been issued in the 50s, but we were looking at them, you know, in the past decade, they specifically said white only. Now, obviously when they, um, interestingly enough, when those deeds that were still empty plots were transferred over to my uncle. They get new deeds with his name. That's out of it now. I mean, as it should be, but it's just, it's interesting. No comments were made about that. Here's the old one. Here's your new one. We don't even talk about that. So, I mean, you're seeing that even in where people can be buried. Yeah. And I think this is again, one of the like incomplete things for me when I, when I, you know, before four or five years ago, when I thought of segregation, like I thought about the South. Right, I just didn't realize or understood the the, the countrywide impacts. Um, even if it wasn't laws passed, and maybe there there were some, but you know that that it was still a very clear black and white segregation in many places of our country. Um, so, what else? Anything else? that you guys are wondering about, that you're thinking about? Mm 
Cool. What time we got? Oh, look at us. So, Tom, are you jumping on again? or? Well, I'm thinking about it, JR. I just, um, I just, um, your last comment kind of implies that all segregation is because of skin color. And um, I just think that's very misleading. Um, simply because, um, I mean, skin color is a, is a marker of culture and people segregate from people who are unlike themselves because of cultural misunderstand cultural understanding misunderstandings happen way more easily um, when you're across culture, when you're dealing with somebody from another culture. So we naturally gravitate to people that are more like us. It's, it's human nature. Um, so I just, I don't like that implicit, um, uh, the implication that, that most segregation is because of skin color. I think that's an error. I think that uh, advances uh, erroneous thinking that makes, that makes an already sensitive is issue even more, uh, even more charged. I think it's unwise to do that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the, for you want to share that. Um, does anybody else have anything that they'd like to add before we jump into the next? No, cool. So this last one, um, it's kind of just a summary, I believe. Yep, a summary and kind of, um, and then we'll we'll jump back. We'll jump back on here again. The goal is around eight thirty to be done with this, but if there's any other conversation that wants to be had kind of post that, um, we can we can go from there. Times. We're, we're turning uh, turning the corner to the finish line, so I have one last question, and then, and then Jim will uh, uh, finish things off with, I think he has another question or two. It, but I want, I'm asking you for advice. Um, imagine a conversation where someone says something like this, and I would like your response. Why do you keep on bringing up slavery, Jim Crow laws, and all that stuff is a distant history to us so why do you keep bringing this up now you gave a hint of it when you started talking about lynching and it's our history but but it's kind of the larger story of why talk about reconstruction and redlining and jim crow laws and you know slavery by another name why talk about all this if it's such a distant history um you know there, there seems to be um behind that kind of question a type of suspicion of why would you tell that story so as a historian how do you respond to that well, I, you know, it, look, here, here's the way I talk to Southerners, Justin, you know, I, I, to other Southerners, I say, look, we've been taught never to forget. We, we've been taught always to remember. Why do we suddenly want to develop amnesia in this other area? We, you know, we want to never forget that our ancestor was in Pickett's charge at Gettysburg, but we do want to forget that 35 years ago, this guy couldn't, couldn't get a job because he was black. Um, and you don't think that impacted his family? You know, I mean, I, 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 can, I can tell you family stories about how we don't like parts of the family because of what they did in uh, 1873, you know, so, but we don't care about what happened to a person in 1934 or 1954 or 1964 or 1972. And so that, that history is a lot closer than people realize. You, you'll get a kick out of this. The, uh, in 1999, after I had been the pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Jackson for three years, I did the funeral of a daughter of a Confederate veteran. Now, you're, you're saying the math doesn't add up. Hold on. Listen to me. He was 16 years old when he fought in the Civil War. He married, outlived his first life, uh, wife, remarried, outlived his second wife. And in the 1890s, uh, he married again a third wife. He was, you know, 30 years older than she was. And in the year 1900, they had a daughter. So he had fought in the Confederate Army 
and his daughter was 99 years old in uh, the year 1999, and I did her funeral. Uh, so the Civil War is closer than a lot of people realize to us. And, and you know, still, you know, Southern, white Southerners are told, remember that, you know, remember that's, that's really important. Why wouldn't we want to remember these other things? That's one thing that I would say, Justin. The other thing is that this, um, this has immediate today effects in ways that I think because most white people have not been affected by this, we don't realize. So I'll give you an example. One of my professors, uh, Dr. Carl Ellis, uh, is a provost professor of theology. He teaches mostly in Atlanta, but he teaches at Jackson and D.C. and all over the place. Uh, Dr. Ellis's dad was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. And when he came back after the war, his dream was to be a commercial pilot. Guess what he couldn't be because he was black? He could not be a commercial pilot. Now, do you think that that economically impacted Carl Ellis and his family, that his dad could not be a commercial? You better believe it dramatically impacted his family that he could not be a commercial pilot. Well, I, Carl, Carl Ellis is my friend. So what happened in the 1940s after Carl Ellis's dad fought for our country, risked his life? for our way of life and for freedom here and around the world, and then came back and could not be a commercial pilot, that has an impact today. All of us ought to care about that. All of us ought to care about that, and especially about fellow Christians. You know, So that I think those are the two ways, Justin, that I would start that kind of conversation with a fellow Southerner who's maybe skeptical about this. Well, well Dr. Carl... So that's so that's where the la the last we'll watch of that of that video. Um, what did you guys? What do you, what are your thoughts about that? About Lig Ligon's response to isn't it all in the past? Um, what is, what is your response to to what he to what he said? I'd certainly say he's absolutely right on that. I mean, the past is never really the past, especially when it's not that far be beyond us. I mean, when you're talking the, C the Civil Rights Act isn't passed till 1968, that outlaws some of the stuff we've you know, been talking about today. I mean, that's um, it's not my lifetime, but I mean, my that's certainly my my parents, you know, and I mean, my my grandparents were you know well into adulthood when that is so i mean there you that's not that long ago and i think as you said i mean you don't think about some of this stuff happening as much in the north so to speak but there's a whole bunch of people who experienced it wherever they were at what else what are other what are other thoughts I was talking to my family um, back when the George Floyd thing was at, the, at its peak and the metaphor that kind of came to my mind was that of like a forest where it's these, these trees were planted with like clear open skies, they grew up tall and then it's like the whole forest canopy is established. So any little sapling that tries to take root, it's like there's no light coming through all these big trees are, are, are blocking all the light. Their, their roots are deep, they're taking all the nutrients. And I guess it kind of feels like to me, it's like we're saying you can only be planted in these areas that are already sucked dry of their, of their capability for you. Um, I was saying it in contrast to my, my brother was positioning something in the line of, well, if you just try hard enough, or if you just like have enough of a work ethic and just, it, it just feels like it's like, I look at Molly and I and how much we've got, we've got from our parents, how much financial help, 
um, just not 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 inheriting any any debt. Um, we have a, a strong support network, just financially speaking. And I think about black people in America have only been able to start planting their seeds like of financial growth less like 50 years ago. And that's like, I, I mean, we look at white people in America and it's hundreds of years now. Um, yeah, it just feels like hard to hard to deny the impact. Yeah. And then I look and I see how much it costs to be poor in America and the the interest you pay, the the increase of healthcare costs and like the the physical, mental, emotional toll and it just feels like yeah, like when you're below a certain line, you're just trying to make it. When you get past a certain point, then you can actually start building. But when you're below a certain point, it's just treading water day in and day out, regardless of your color. But for sure, plays into it. So, so I'm gonna so I'm gonna say this word, okay? Because it's probably on the tip of most of our tongues or in our minds, right? Um, that it is so loaded and so volatile right now, but this, this idea of privilege, right? And so I actually had a conversation with a person of color just, just about this. I was like, help me on when you, when, when, when I hear this discussed, like, what am I, what am I hearing? Right. And, and it was really helpful for me to understand that like this person said, um, like, we're, like, we're not saying that you haven't had to work incredibly hard. We're not saying that you've had everything handed to you. We're not saying you haven't worked your butt off, right? But it's the idea that that maybe there are other people, other cultures that have had to work a little bit harder to get where you are, right? Or like I think about myself, like like when we when Lauren and I bought our first house, um, we we couldn't get a loan on the house because it wasn't in great shape, and we we had a family member that was willing to loan us twenty thousand dollars. We quit. We we bought the house. We paid them back, right? Like I'm not ashamed that my family member was able to have that kind of money and 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 let and let us have that. But I also do understand that there are many many people, black or white or or Hispanic or whatnot, that don't that didn't have that luxury that Lauren and I have. Because of that house, we were able to buy this house. And because of that house, we were able to buy the car that we have. Because, right? And so, um, but but when when you hear the word privilege, right, people aren't saying, hey, you've got everything handed to you on a silver platter. Right. They're they're not they're not saying you haven't had to work your butt off to get where you are. Right. And so I just wanted to, from a conversation that I had, I just wanted to clarify that because it can be such a loaded, loaded and explosive word. Um, so I don't know if that was the time to share that or not, but it, it felt, felt relevant. So. I, I think you both hit on something important there. I mean, it is really hard to sometimes in America today sort out the um, racial impacts and the economic impacts, the class impacts, and where those lines cross each other and how they intermingle with each other for how things are experienced today. And it isn't always easy to draw a straight line back to because someone was denied a home loan in 1937 is why someone is or isn't in poverty today. That's it's really hard to draw those straight lines through history, but all you can do is really look at the trends. I mean, I, I just pulled it up looking at this, the census figures. I mean, real median income for non-Hispanic whites is seventy thousand dollars. This for is blacks. This is in the country. Yeah, for this is two thousand eighteen from Census Bureau. I mean, you're looking. Asians have the highest at you know eighty seven thousand. Whites are at, you know. 70,000 and blacks are at 41,000 and Hispanics at 51,000. So 
Now you could try to figure out a million different things of why those fall the way they do and look at it a different way. But I mean, no one can argue with the facts of where you see in those groups of that income level. Yeah. yeah do you remember what the, do you remember what the levels were for actually like family, family wealth? And I, I talked about that earlier this year, one Sunday morning, and I have to go back and look at it. But yeah, it's definitely it's something like five times or something. I mean, it was significantly yeah. higher for 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 white people as it was to people of color. And and, I, and I'll be honest we, with you, we can't even say people of color, right? Because Asians are are considered people of color, but for, specifically for for the black community, it's significantly less. Yeah, yeah. Looking at black versus white, I mean you. There's a whole, you can get into a whole explanation for why Asian turned out better than white when you look at some of these. But yeah, I mean, in fact, I actually, the the very the variance, everything I read was so high, I questioned whether, you know, kind of Mark would probably appreciate it more, got in a mean, median mode to try to figure out where these apples to apples comparisons. And yes, I mean, so it's not, you can't say because you know, Jeff Bezos is white and he's worth billions of dollars. And, you know, so is Mark Zuckerberg. Does that disproportionately skew? No, we're talking like, what's the average, not all it's called median. So you draw them all, what's the median? That's it. So, I mean, it really does hold true. Right. Yeah, for sure. Again, guys, empathy, compassion, right? That's that that is the goal for all of this is as as we as we build relationships with um, neighbors, coworkers, people in our city, um, some that are our brothers, sisters in Christ and some that are not that that deeply need Jesus. Right. Is what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn to see through other people's eyes. Right. Um, and so that so that's 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 the goal here, right? It's not it's not to make us feel bad about ourselves, not to make it's not to make us feel shame. It's to learn and to grow and to understand, right? That we would have compassion, and that compassion would lead us to action in one way or another, right? And that's and that's for us as as compassion grows in us, that's to go before the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do, right? But we don't want our action motivated by anything other than compassion. We don't want our action motivated by guilt, by shame, by what other people tell us to do or what uh, what political politics tells us to do. Like that's not where we're what we're going to be moved by. We're going to be moved by compassion and action in Jesus, and he because he's the answer to all this, right? Um, and so that's our that's our goal here, right? And so we have we have mon- one more week of this left. Um, next week, we're going to look at civil rights to the present day, and we're going to do a very similar thing. If you're able to watch it ahead of time, um, that would be great, and it'll help you kind of bring questions or thoughts to the table. But again, Adam and I will go through and pick out specific clips that we feel like are the most helpful for conversation, um, and we'll kind of do a similar thing. And then um, I believe we're going to take a week off. We're not going to have a building empathy or building a passion on. Um, Ash Wednesday, we're going to do some kind of a prayer gathering on Zoom. Um, but the following week, we'll probably jump, jump back in. And I'm hoping to be able to begin to have some kind of personal testimonies and personal stories that will help us kind of bring bring it, bring it this conversation even a little bit closer. Um, I've still, I've, I've yet to be able to, to, to iron out who and when and what, but that's, that, that's my goal at this point. Um, is there anything? Is there anything else that would be helpful for you guys, as you think about um, what would help you kind of build compassion or build empathy? Um, do you have any other thoughts about any anything else that would be helpful? Okay. Well, as as you do, if that does come up, um, feel free to message Adam and I, um, and we can we can kind of add that to our our planning going forward. Anything else you want to say, buddy? Yeah, I, I was going to say, if, if anyone's even look listening to the video for next week, and you got specific things you want to make sure we include or questions about that, let us know on that.
Um, I do have something I just thought of that um, when uh, Legan was talking about when, one of the questions that the interviewers asked, you know, was why, why do you care? What's your personal story? And he just kept talking about things that are things that we've been talking about in our church. You know, he said, because I have friends who have had completely different experiences than I've had based on the color of their skin. And, he, and at the end of, I think it was at the end of this one, he says that, you know, we're not trusted for good reasons. He said, people like me, I mean, he just kept pointing to himself and using him himself. People like me have been doing awful things to, you know, black families for four centuries. And he said, you know, he reminded us about, you know, loving our neighbors because they are in the image of God, no matter, you know, what nationality or what ethnicity or whatever. And he was just talking about, can you imagine the gospel impact if, if white churches or white believers would say, you know, not on our watch, You're, you know, we're not going to treat people like this or um, just this concept that they're talking, he was talking about changing the state flag of Mississippi and, and um, which I think is happening currently. And he said, this state belongs to you as much as it belongs to me. You know, if whites were able to say that, what, you know, what that might do for building bridges for the gospel. So anyway, that just made me think about the art of neighboring and, you know, just what we've been talking about as a church all along, mm -hmm. yeah. fleshing that out in this arena. For sure, for sure. For sure. Okay, well, I'm going to stop the video real quick. Um, and then